I feel so privileged to have been given the honour of welcoming this wonderful lady. And even though probably she kind of doesn't need introduction, I, I want to do so anyway. <laughs> she is. She's, she's a senior leader here at Cornerstone. She's wife to Julian. She's a mother. She's now a grandmother as well. Congratulations, by the way, Matthew and, and Precious. Fantastic. I might come and get some hints from all of you soon. You're about to be grandmothers ourselves. Aren't we? Not, well, you're not going to be a grandmother, but... Um. Dearing me, I host a meeting. My <laughs> second... No. <laughs> um, she's all those things. and wonderful. She looks after her family, cares for her family, and she cares for the church family here as well. But she's also so much more than that as well. And without Sarah, we wouldn't all be here in this organized, amazing conference that goes on. This is her hard work with a team around her. But this is, this is her produces this. And, and I have to say, uh, one thing I have missed, and I would love if that happens again, is that the women who lead. She's the person who's actually put on a conference for women that I would attend. Because I don't do women's meetings otherwise. You know? <laughs> Which is brilliant. And, and, just, and also, I love the way God has so anointed her in the ability to communicate. And it is, I, I love hearing what she brings, even if it's like kind of 101 things to do with the tent peg. And I think there's probably a few of you will know what I mean by that one. But even the ability to kind of take facts and figures and statistics and actually bring them to life and actually stir up faith. That is a real skill, that, and that is a real anointing from God to be able to do things like that. So please listen to this lady as she comes up here, because Sarah is wonderful. Come up, Sarah. That's where I'm at. The other thing I say, I, I feel really privileged to say she's my friend as well. Good. Yeah, thank I you. love this lady so much. I'm just going to pray for her before she speaks. Yeah, Father... I want to thank you so much for Sarah. I want to thank you for what you do in her life, who she is, who you've created her to be. She's a precious, precious lady to many of us, but she's so much more precious to you. And I just want to pray now, Holy Spirit, will we just continue to fill her and anoint her and equip her for all it is that you've given her to bring and share with us today. And I pray for all of us that we will have ears and hearts open to hear and allow what she's bringing to come into us and stir up faith and stir up change in us as well, Father. So just pray now, Lord, will you bless this lovely lady and help her now as she, as she brings what she's bringing to us. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Over Thanks, for, Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. And um, first of all, I'd just like to say, um, you know, thank you to all the production team from Cornerstone and even our ex-Cornerstones who are like different parts of the country now have come back specially to facilitate the production and all the volunteers. So let's give them a round of applause. Thank you to everybody. <clears throat> Now, I felt a little bit emotional seeing all your faces, and it reminds me of a story that Chloe told when she led the meeting the other Sunday morning. She told this story about how in the middle of COVID, she was trying to do a PhD, and she's doing this PhD in healing stories across Wales. She hadn't seen anybody, couldn't go out. Do you remember when we could only go for one walk or one shop? And she was feeling a little bit down, missing everybody. And uh, she said, I know what I'll do. I'll go to Tesco. I'm allowed my one shop. And she went to Tesco, and in the sea of faces and strangers behind masks, she suddenly hears her father's whistle. And she looked down the aisle, and there was Julian, and they couldn't, they couldn't meet, they couldn't hug, but from a distance, she could see his face. And she said, that's all I needed. And when she told that story, all our church kind of went, aww. <laughs> but I feel like that today, just to see you all and see your faces and... Thanks for those joining us on live stream. Isn't it good to be together? And um, it was so strange when churches were closed and then we could go back and then the children couldn't go back and we've been through such a journey, haven't we? So we're going to look at a few things together this afternoon now. Um, but I want to share a few COVID stories, some of the things that happened even in all the restrictions. So one day, you know, we we're all working from home. So I'm at my dining room table, my desk, my home office, actually just the dining room table. But it has a view of all the comings and goings in the street. Did anyone else have a view like that maybe? You learned a lot about your neighbors. And so there I am at the desk and um, I saw our postman come up the path and his hand was all bandaged 
bandaged up and he had his sack and he had all the posts and he came up the path with his hand all bandaged and then very, very awkwardly, he tried to get the post out, put it through the door and um, I thought, oh, that's, he's obviously injured his hand, that's a shame. Anyway, a few days later at my desk, see him come up still with the bandage on. So I opened the door and his name is Dan and I said, hi, Dan. He's like, oh, because you know, he's about to post the letters, the door's open. And I said, Dan, what's the matter with your hand? He said, I don't know what I've done, but I've injured it. The doctor can't do anything. I can't afford to lose my job, so I'm still doing my job, but I'm just in so much pain. And we're at two meters distance on the doorstep now. So I said to him, well, Dan, you know, in our church, we pray for one another when we're sick, and Jesus heals our bodies, and often people get healed straight away. Would you like me to pray for you? And he's like, Okay, so from a two meter distance, I said, Jesus, you love Dan. Come and heal his hand. Bless him now, take away all the pain in his hand and heal his hand. And he went, thanks. I didn't like to ask him like one to 10 and all that that we've done in the past. And I just happened to have some popcorn. Now this is a long story, but if you ever get, buy popcorn from a supermarket and it's moldy, it's worth the email, let me tell you that. So I had so much popcorn that had been delivered. So I said, I had a big bag and I said, hey, you got kids, would you like the popcorn? Threw him the popcorn. He anti-backs it, not really, but for the sake of the, he anti-backs it, of course, with glass. So he walked back to the van, and when he got to the van, he opened the door, and he threw the popcorn in, he turned around, and he went, thanks for both, the popcorn and the hand. Now, the following week, or a few days later, I was on a new and Cymru core team Zoom, most exciting highlight of my week. And I'm sat there on Zoom, and uh, we're on Zoom, and uh, I see Dan walking up the path, no bandage. I say, hang on a minute, guys, and I go to the door, open the door, say, Dan, what happened to your hand? He said, weird thing, after you said that prayer thing, he said, I went home, all the pain are gone, it's completely better. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) Yes. And he's so warm and friendly with us now. So let me tell you another one. We were doing a kingdom intensive on Zoom with Bruce. I think we did it twice a week for like six weeks, didn't we? Mondays and Thursdays. Kingdom intense, intensive. <laughs> and maybe some of you were on it. I can't remember. And um, after, you know, different people were speaking, so it was Bruce speaking and Chloe and Matthew and others. And um, I don't know, did you do a talk to you then? Not on this occasion. But we were all there as the team after to pray for people. And we went into little Zoom rooms. So I was on this Zoom room with a screen of people. And we all had to pray for each other for healing. And I was delighted. I don't know if she's even here or watching. But in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen was a lady who had a food intolerance. She's in the room. And remind me your name. Carolyn. Carolyn. Carolyn had a food intolerance. Now, when you described it, I got excited because it was the same thing I had had years ago. And it's a horrible thing, isn't it, where if you eat certain foods, it's like the brain swells, you're really ill, you can be ill for weeks, it's a terrible thing. It affects your whole life, your family, you can't eat out, all these things. So anyway, her face lit up. My, I was like, whoa, I know, I know Carolyn's going to get healed. So I prayed on Zoom, and we prayed, didn't we? And we prayed that she would be totally healed this food intolerance, and she was, and she's sitting here. But not only that, her husband had a very unusual skin condition with um, like sores all over his body, and he was like at, the, at his wit's end. And you shared with him, or he saw that you were better, and so he asked for prayer, and he came on the Zoom. Not only is he healed, but he gave his life to Jesus. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> And lastly, a little shout out to my favorite son-in-law. I only have one uh, at the moment. But my favorite son-in-law, Russo, who's sitting over there. So when Chloe was doing a PhD, she really needed help. It was just chaos and so much work. And I had broken my hand, long story, you don't have time for that. But I had broken my hand. I said, I can't come around and clean or help or anything. But what I'll do, I'll get a cleaner to come in for a few weeks. And I just mentioned to Russo, I said, look, I use this cleaner for uh, my father-in-law to help look after him. But she's got a really bad back. So when she comes over the house, maybe you can just pray for her. So one day, I was sat at the desk working. Chloe rings me up. Listen to this, mum. She is recording. Russo downstairs praying for the healer, the cleaner, and her back got healed. Yay! (laughs) So, this is what the kingdom looks like. 
COVID or no COVID, it's bursting out. It can't be contained on Zoom, off Zoom, in lockdown, not in lockdown. The kingdom of God will not be tamed, it will not be restricted. And you and I, gosh, we've been through a long two years, haven't we, of navigating lockdowns, fire breaks, furloughs, restrictions. It's been really hard, many, many changes to navigate and some grief and mourning along the way. Maybe we've lost some people, but maybe we've had fresh opportunities as well. And we've all had to adapt. I remember on the eve of lockdown, Julian driving around the city, dropping off microphones to various people. Then we suddenly realized somehow Sundays had to be done differently. The young couples in our church who were due to get married that month rang, rang us up and they're like, can you marry us tonight before lockdown begins? We can. So in our cafe at 11 o'clock at night, be in Darko, Darko's up there on directing today, Russo and Chloe um, and, and B. we married them in the cafe on the eve of lockdown. There we are, way. They had lovely honeymoons in lockdown, isn't that? <laughs> Welcome to intensity. So well done, guys. And, um, you know, there we all are, aren't we, doing life on Zoom suddenly, Alpha on Zoom, marriage prep on Zoom, small groups. What about our projects? We, churches across Wales are amazing at projects, but suddenly our buildings are closed. What do we do with our projects? Churches began adapting all over the country. For us, our kids' work had to go online. We set up a kids' page. Schools became open, but visitors weren't allowed in. So some of our team here, and Beth, who's been leading worship there, they started creating a assemblies on film that they could be taken into school. What did you do when your projects closed? I mean, I know for some of you, you had like kitchens feeding the village. Now for us, we couldn't set up new things. So we started supporting our local food share and the two of them, and we started having more of a relationship with those in the community. What about you? We all had to find a way, didn't we, to change with the restrictions that we won't compromise on the most important things, which is still getting the gospel out, serving the poor, making sure the kingdom is still advanced. Online services. Steep learning curve for us all. Did anyone see on Zoom, the vicar on Zoom, the vicar who was doing the sacraments and set himself on fire because he's doing it by candlelight? Do you see that? That was my favorite. <laughs> He's all right now. He was on fire. <laughs> so we're all filming on our phones and our iPads. As a church, we filmed in the kitchen. For us, it was the only tidy corner that I would let the world see in the kitchen. Some people ask, why is your window bricked up? And I'm like, no, that's just the path to the garage. This is the only tidy corner of the house. In the park, I know Sean and Adam here, Adam's our centre manager, they decided to mix it up and they filmed in the garden and then in the greenhouse on the hottest day of the year. <laughs> mistake, mistake. <laughs> Suddenly, we all found we had a wider audience. We started looking at our viewing um, uh, uh, statistics of seeing countries all over the world watching. How astonishing is that? We found the challenge, did you find this the same, of keeping our DNA online, that the DNA of the church, we don't become something else through the lens of the camera, but we're true to ourselves. So for us, that was quite a lot of messing about <laughs> and uh, just staying relevant and true to who we are in our identity. But did you find we all had to read the local mood? We couldn't be putting something online that's intense or too sad because people are already finding it intense and sad. So having to read the mood, read the mood of the nation, read the mood of who's watching beyond the lens. And that's something we still need to be thinking about. It's not the same as just in the room anymore. Think about what are we communicating? Because it's way more than the words that we say, it's the feel that we create. When people are joining us through the lens, how do they feel about what's happening? Do they see us communicating and talking about a real living relationship with a real God? Or is it like a religious service? Or is it something dynamic in the way that we pray, in the way that we speak about him that we love? What is being communicated? And can we produce suitable content for all our non-Christian friends and neighbors who are now watching? Because it's not in the house anymore. Is out there, relevant to their life, 
that we are engaging, maybe non-religious, it's everyday life. Is it reaching the people who are watching, who are looking, who are searching? And is there content for the kids or did we leave them out? And all this leads people closer to Jesus because suddenly people had nothing else to do but to sit on a laptop or on their phone and many people started watching church to discover what it really is. I found it interesting helping to, we created new teams here and being able to spark the vision in our teams for the congregation beyond the room and giving them a sense of value and excitement for the people they're reaching beyond those that they can see. And we had to invest in equipment and training. And, you know, Jake here has been amazing in helping us. He sat right in the middle here, and he's doing a seminar later on how to do your best live stream. Not just the technical, but the whole heart behind it. I encourage you to get along to that. So for us as a church, and I'm sure for you as well, we are a missional nation wanting to reach out, aren't we? The projects that you do are amazing. Us all banding together for Mission to Wales, however crazy that was, was astonishing, seeing the opening, on, opening, on the, the, uh, opening of people's hearts on the street. And for us, it was to stay committed to the outward focus, to care for our people, make sure everyone's okay first. A bit like when they say on an airplane, put your own mask on first before you help the person next to you. But right, we've all got our mask on. Okay, we're right now. We've got to keep the outward focus and have a vision, not just now for our village or our city or our street, but for the world who are engaging with us. What a challenge. So I'm sure you agree, it's a huge learning curve, wasn't it, for us all? And we are still learning, lifelong learners. So COVID has been a challenging season for us all, and now here we are together. And it's brilliant. And it's like hearing that little whistle, and there you are, and we're all together. Well done, everybody. So what have we learned from this season? And I just want to look this afternoon at a few lessons that we may have learned from this season that will carry us forward into what comes next. And so we're going to look at a few leadership essentials going forward. You up for that? Good. Okay, the first one, the starting place really, is our identity. Who are we as the church? And more than ever, our deep core value is that church is a community, a body, living stones, not a service, not a meeting, not a building. And we know this, but do we reflect it in our language? I know when we pioneered, we refused to call our building, once we had one, the church. We would say, we're going up the building. It just got called the building. Even now, 30 years later, we go, are you going to be up the building later? We call this venue too. We don't say, we're going to church. I'll see you after church. We might say, I'm going to the meeting. I'll see you after the service. But I'm not going to the church because we are the church. It's not a building or a service or a meeting. Didn't COVID show us that? Suddenly, the doors of our buildings or our community center or our front room or wherever we met were closed. But the church continued because we are a body, we are a community, we are living stones. And more than ever, we need to carry that deep core inner value within us. That when we talk about church, what are we really talking about? Are we talking about the Sunday morning service or are we talking about the community of believers who live in our street, our village, our town, our city? And that is really important. It everything else that we do springs from that. So if we only see church as a Sunday morning meeting, our ministry models become narrow focused to that context. And we can't find a Sunday way of ministry that works in the everyday. So if we want to empower our congregations to be witnessing and praying for the sick and healing and inviting to Alpha in the everyday, it has to be freed from the service because we are the church, we're not going to church. And I think more than ever, when crisis hits and our buildings are closed, the church carries on. Now, I know that many people found who talk to us across the, the nation, especially in other nations we've spoken to, where they have a service-only model, when the doors closed, everything stopped because it was just a service. And crisis reveals, crisis reveals what is. And so let us together 
have that core, deep value. The church is the body, the community, the family of God, whether we're in a meeting or not. And so it starts with our identity. And if COVID did anything, it showed us that. And carrying forward, we need to make sure we carry a biblical view like an Acts 2 church community going forward. Number two, this is one of my favorite ones now. Number two, we need agility. We need to have the ability to pivot. When things change, we can change. We need to be nimble and respond quickly. Agility. We're not known for that as the church, are we? <laughs> we think we might decide something, has to go through this committee, that committee, this, you know, this forum that goes in an email, we pray about it, we think about it later. We're not very agile normally. But suddenly when COVID hit, we needed to be agile and we need to continue with that going forward. And it is a leadership mentality. It starts with the leadership. Leaders, we have to have an agile leadership style that we are ready, we are thinking that way, that we can adapt quickly and have the ability to be agile. It's important that we're not slow, resisting, in denial, putting everything on pause, or hoping for the old ways to come back. The old ways aren't coming back. Am I okay with this, boys? I need to change the microphone, am I all right? Okay, fine. Adapting, not waiting. And we need now, across Wales, a fresh wave of agility to continually adapt to a changing world. Because many, many things changed. And um, some things really changed for the good, didn't they? Julian's mother, she, we've been caring for, she passed away during COVID. And I had to do all like the death admin that takes like about six weeks. But so much of it had gone online. No longer did I have to get in a car, drive down to town, find somewhere to park, go in and sort something out. Suddenly now, it can be done online, on the phone. Many things have changed, haven't they? And the church needs to change too. And Liz Wiseman, who you may have heard of, who wrote Ricky Smarts, among other books, she's a researcher and leadership advisor to executives around the world. And Matthew, um, for one Christmas present, he taped a load of podcasts and put them on a CD for me. And yes, my car is so old, I still have a CD player in it, which the children were like, CD in your car, yes, and thank you, Matthew. So I've been listening, I found it in a box, and I was like, oh gosh, he bought me this for Christmas, I never listened to it. And I've been playing it, and it was really, it's an amazing podcast. And just last week, I was listening to Liz Wiseman. She recorded this pre-COVID, and as a researcher and leadership advisor, she was saying it is critical with the fast-changing pace of the world. This is what is the most critical thing for leaders. It's not what we know, but how fast we can change. Isn't that was like prophetic? This is before COVID, she said it. It's not what we know as leaders, it's how fast we can change. And it's really important. We may have been leading church for many years, or you may just be starting off a church plant. But our ability to change and adapt to what's happening in the world is essential. Now, we have the same core message. It is the same mission. That doesn't change. But how we communicate it has to change. Or soon we will find we can't keep up with the changes at all. It takes courage to be swift. We need to not be hampered by too much process. Now, maybe you're in a denomination where there are certain processes that can't be skipped, but maybe there's other processes that we just invented that can be short-circuited or fast-tracked so that we can be quicker. We need to build a model of church that can quickly adapt in times of change. I want us to think about how can we fast track our processes while staying true to our core values? So not skimping on the core values, but are there some processes that we can speed because we need to? Another essential is to develop teams. Now, sometimes as leaders, we like to do it ourselves because we think it's not done properly if we do it ourselves or we check it. But in that way, we just make everything slower 
and less efficient. And we need to multiply ourselves. And then when a crisis time hits, our teams and team leaders know what to do. They're already trained, they're already in position. And sometimes it's a team leader or a team member who can, has the solution to something on the ground much faster than us having a little meeting about it and waiting for that process to go all the way down the chain. And it's essential we learn to duplicate and multiply. And if you haven't yet created team, start with somebody, start with any Anybody. Start with someone who shows a glimmer of hope, who can breathe and move and listen to what you say. Anybody, nearly anyone can be trained up if they have a good heart. Let's get training so the team leaders on the ground, because we've gone through COVID, but that might not be the last strange thing that hits us or happens. We all know that. And so this has been a trial run for other things that might be ahead. So let's get with the program and get ourselves sorted. What really helps with raising teams is creating a value framework. And so when you give someone a job or even just anything within your church, if we have like a, a value framework, you can set them free within the frame. So the framework might be, this is our DNA, this is our values, this is the objective, this is your job description. This is the frame within which you are free to operate. And so they can run free with their ideas and they can feed them back to you, but not taking hours to sort it out. But once there's a value framework, you can set people free that we're not micromanaging every department in the church. And in that way, we can reach our desired outcomes quicker by making sure. Now, sometimes what we've done, you see, we've picked out somebody, you show a bit of potential, potential, given them a task, but no boundaries. There's no frame. They're running with something without being given any, well, within, within this framework, do anything you like. So let's run with that. It's a real growth strategy to give someone a job, but make sure there's a frame within which they can run. Okay, number three. Are you, are you enjoying these essentials? Number three, plan ahead. Sometimes we have to plan ahead prophetically because we don't know what's ahead, but we can get ready. And this is like when I think about Noah. And as you know, in Genesis 6 to 8, Noah built an ark by faith. He didn't know what was coming. He just had a blueprint. And he had to build something by faith. And there he was, he had got this warning of floodwaters that he's never seen before. And he created a new shape to God's design, ready for the floods to come. And when the crisis came, he was ready. And our challenge is to build a new shape for changing times that are coming to God's design. Are we building a shape that can respond to crisis? Are we quick to move? Do we have our teams in place? Are we moving forward? So we hold to our values, but we're able to pivot quickly to new styles and models while holding those core values true. I think one of the challenges to us is that there are many precious things to us that aren't necessarily like, you know, biblical things. They're just our own little thing that are now outdated practices. And it's time to let them go. There are some things that we do that are actually holding us back. And we need to look again. Now, did any of you find with COVID, it was a great time to close some things that needed closing? Do you find that? And in the same way, maybe there's little ways of doing things or practices or traditions or customs that actually need to be re-examined because they're holding us back. Now, the experts predict, these are like future experts who look at the future and everything, this is what they predict. They say it's predictable that the future will be increasingly unpredictable. It's going to be less linear and more unpredictable. So let's get ready. Let's shape ourselves up for the unexpected. Now, in the first um, lockdown, I had this really strange dream. And I had this dream. And in the dream, I was in a Land Rover. And I was with some colleagues that we all used to be on the Gap together. And I could see a few here um, from the Gap. And uh, in, in the dream, we were in this Land Rover. And we were going on a really like bumpy off-road course. And I was sat in the front passenger seat and someone else was driving. And we were going along this bumpy like course. And I could, I could see the map, so I was reassured. I like a good map. And I, I could see the map, but the map, it was a big paper 
paper map stuck on the windscreen, on the inside of the windscreen. So we're bumping along now, following the map on the windscreen, and I suddenly realize we can't see. We can't see through the windscreen because the old map is in the way. And I woke up and I was like, whoa, that is the Lord speaking to me. That for our own church, the old ways or the old map, be careful it's not stuck on the windscreen, that we're following it, but we can't see the road anymore. And we're going on a new adventure together. And things have changed. And we need to take the old map off that we can see. And we can drive by the Spirit with God's help, navigating the new road, bringing our past experience, but not in a way that holds us back, but in in a way that helps us navigate the new journey ahead. Number four, new tools. There are some new tools out there to do what we need to do. Now recently, you know the new Talking Jesus survey? These are good tools where we go and research what's happening in our nation. And to pick out two things from that survey that was really shows the warmer climate that Julian was talking about. They asked people who don't know Jesus, who aren't Jesus followers, where would you go to find out more about Jesus? And their number one was Google, 26%. If they're looking for Jesus, they go to the internet. You know, we have got to be thinking about what's through the lens. They are searching for Jesus on the internet, closely followed by church and the Bible. Bible, 22%. Church, 22%. Google, 26%. They're still coming to church. They're still looking at the Bible, but they go to Google first. That tells us a lot. But people are searching for Jesus. The other thing they asked is, would you like to know more about Jesus? Now, do you remember back in 2015 when they first did this survey, they found one in five people were actively pursuing finding out about Jesus. That's a lot. That's a lot more than we thought, one in five. But now in 2022, it's one in three. Their research showed one in three people are searching for Jesus. And it's worth, worth looking up that study because there's loads of stuff in there about a great attitude to Christians, to friends who know Jesus, and searching for Jesus. And so let's use new tools. One of the new tools, Imagine Heaven. That is a great course. It's like a, almost like a kind of pre-alpha. It's looking at those questions all through COVID. When we've got death on our screens, counted every day. People are wondering what happens next. Imagine Heaven fits in that niche so well. And later Later on this afternoon, Matthew will be talking through what the course is, how to use it. It's a brilliant course. I encourage you to go along to that. Also, our old favorites, Alpha, Youth Alpha, the way they've revamped it, it's amazing. Seminar on that this afternoon with Beth Sharp. Go along to that too. You can't go to all three, but it's going to be really good. Let's make sure we're using these tools. But one of these tools that is here to stay is hybrid. Hybrid church, in person and online. It's not going anywhere. It's here to stay. Now, for some churches, they're like, oh, phew, COVID is over. We don't have to do that anymore. No, we have got to. There is a world out there looking for Jesus beyond the lens of a camera. It can't just be in-house. And I think if Jesus was here in person, he would be using the camera too to reach everybody. Instead, he has us to do it. So let's look a little bit at the hybrid situation. COVID forced us to go online and we discovered a whole wider community, a try before you buy. We know this is true because if you want to buy a new lawnmower or a new pair of trainers, you go online and you research what other people thought about it. You want to book a holiday, you go on TripAdvisor and see what everybody else said about the facilities. Try before you buy. And people are looking and searching. And they want to be part of church. They want to discover it. And so just going back to meeting in-house is losing all those people who are searching for Jesus. Now, this is a challenging opportunity. Many of us were fast-tracked into a slightly less mediocre version of live streaming that we're still learning, but we can't go back. It is a new tool, and it's essential. Online is a door for many. Now, Matthew was telling me, Matthew lives in a flat, Matthew and Precious. 
I, I hate to brag about being a grandma, because that's boring, isn't it? You know when people start going on about being a nana, you know, I, uh, but little Josiah, if you're watching, darling, <laughs> mummy's here, you know. So proud of you, precious, great mum, well done. Did I, did I mention Josiah, my grandchild? <laughs> anyway, so Matthew um, and Precious and little Josiah, who's my grandson, they, they live in this flat. And downstairs from the flat, they got two neighbors, the eco-friendly neighbor and the Hoover neighbor. So one neighbor, one side, he's got a shop that's all to do with take your own containers and fill it up, save energy. And the other side, the guy is selling everything you need to plug in, Hoover, everything, you know. So it's really, it's quite funny. So all through lockdown and filming, as Matthew went to and from his flat he started to share with the neighbors and they started watching the services online and asking him questions and the other day I just happened to be saying goodbye to Matthew and the guy in the hoover shop had a parcel for Matthew and I was like don't worry I'll get it he recognized me from the live stream we started talking like we're old friends he felt he knew me because he'd seen me so much through the camera it's so funny and the other neighbor the other side eco-friendly guy he said to Matthew one day can I come to the picnic now, we'd advertise a church picnic like at the end of the meeting. He had watched the meeting all the way through to the picnic being advertised. Amazing. So can you see how people want to connect with the community? They want to connect with what they see. Another lady and her daughter turned up here after COVID. Did you find that? People turned up. You've been watching you online. You never met. And she came up and she said, oh, I, I just have to stand next to you in person because I've only seen you through a camera. And I, I know that you are real, but I just want to see that you really are real. <laughs> okay. Kerry Newhoff. He is a leadership author and church planter. If you want to be truly scared, go on his website for just half an hour. And uh, he has some great uh, quotes, really, about how COVID has changed the church. He says, for us as churches, content alone won't cut it. Community and connection will. Now, you and I, we might be really worried about, you know, how does the band sound and how did the worship go? Uh, how good was my preach? You know, did people listen? Did they take it on board? But what Kerry is saying, people have changed now because if they want the best worship, they go online for it. If they want the best preaching, they go online for it. They don't need to listen to us. They go online. You can get the best in the world online. But what you can't get online is connection and community. And who are we? What's our identity? We are community. And as long as we walk in the identity that we're community, we have something to offer that no one else does in that way. And so we have the community. That's what people are looking for. Okay, a few scary Kerry Newhoff quotes. Here we go. Be the local church. Nobody should be able to out-local or out-community the local church. That's true. Stop worrying about, I mean, obviously our content needs to be suitable for the viewer. I don't mean like we put any old rubbish out there, but it's the community they're looking for. Next one, he says, the goal of online is not just content, but connection. This is what he says. But the point is, everyone you want to reach is online. If you miss the internet, you miss them and all the opportunity that comes with it. Leaders who cooperate with reality, tend to do far better than those who compete with it. Here's what's critical, he says. The mission isn't dead, but the methods just might be. Whoa. Okay. So let's finish with this. I want to finish with something that really struck me in lockdown. And it's going to Ecclesiastes. I bet you all preached on this, didn't you? in COVID. Did you all preach on Ecclesiastes seasons, you know, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing? <laughs> Ecclesiastes 3, the famous passage on seasons. So the first thing about that passage is that it's very comforting that we see from the Bible seasons exist. We didn't just invent this. This is a season that we're going through and life doesn't stay the same. Now in church, it might look the same for the last 50 years, <laughs> but the world doesn't stay the same and we can't stay the same. We can't stay the same. Okay, Ecclesiastes 3, I want to pick out one verse here. There's a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. I want to just talk about this at the end now. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. Now I did ask Jez, 
if you go down the beach and get me 300 stones, you all had one. And then we discovered it was illegal, so we didn't. So you just pretend now, just pretend you got this non-illegal stone. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. Now, you know in the Bible, often people gathered stones as a sign. Like when Julian was talking this morning about how, remember, they, they crossed into the promised land finally, and Joshua got them to drag 12 big stones that represented the tribes and as a memorial of what happened and God with them. Remember Jacob and Laban making a covenant and eating a meal by piling up stones and they ate next to the meal. And often stones represented remembering something. Well, in this context, what I want to look at is not so much the gathering stones, but a time to scatter stones. So um, looking at this, it reminded me of that passage in Isaiah where is the song of the vineyard. So we're going to read this. So the song of the vineyard, Isaiah 5, 1 to 2, it says this. Next slide, please, Fee. lovely. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. I'm just going to read it again. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Okay, let's look at this. You notice here that the owner of the vineyard, who loves his vineyard, he has a fertile vineyard, he dug it up. He dug up a fertile vineyard and planted fresh. To do that, he cleared the stones and he rebuilt. The point in this passage here is that the hillside was fertile. It was already a great vineyard, but he dug it up. And he changed something that was growing and fertile for increase. And now in this context, we know that this is about God clearing the ground that Israel could flourish. And this is about the gardener here building something new and vibrant, a vineyard of choicest vines with new fruit, new wine, Holy Spirit destiny. And this is the point for us. The soil was fertile they needed to clear it of stones and plant new. Our churches, even before COVID, they're in a good place. And now something has happened that has pruned us. And it's like going into a fertile vineyard and digging it up. You didn't go into a decayed vineyard. Oh, it's decayed, it's old. We've got to dig this up and start again. It was a fertile vineyard. But he went in and took out the old, even though it was fertile, to plant new. And this is for us, where we have fertile churches, but there are things that need to be new, things that need to be changed. And the only way, when he dug it up, that he could plant new was to remove the stones. Now, prophetically, those stones are some of the things we're doing that need to be removed, need to be changed. Old processes, things that are slow, things that are holding us up. You know what that stone is for you. And God is saying to us, come and remove the stones from the vineyard. What is it now going into a fresh season that we need to be free from, that we can see through the windscreen? I like too that they built a watchtower. The watchtower's watching out. Now for us, what are we watching for? We're watching in our village, in our town, those who are warm, those who are turning to Jesus. We don't need to have a defensive old style of evangelism anymore, but we can walk with our heads held high and share about Jesus because people are interested. And the next thing I like is that he built a wine press. Now in a vineyard, grapes are grapes. They're hanging on the vine and they're either going to fall to the ground and be wasted or someone's going to pick them. But he built a wine press. This is a wine factory on the site. And so the wine didn't stay in the house. It didn't stay in the vineyard. But it got made in a wine factory in the, in the wine press. It got made into wine and wine travels. So the village could have the wine. The next village could share the wine. The city could share the wine. It could be taken all over the world. And from one vineyard, the vineyard is still there. The roots are still in the soil. But the fruit travels. 
And for you and I, the fruit is ready to travel. People are ready to drink it through the lens, in the room, in our communities, in our street. Let's make sure we're not an old vineyard. It's all right. It's all okay. It's been like this a hundred years. Let's just keep it as it is. No, it's time to dig up the old, throw out the stones, plant new, that the fruit can go all over the nation. And then we can see change come. The Holy Spirit is breathing through our nation. He is preparing people before we're ready to do it. Even before we plan our mission, he's preparing the hearts in your streets and in your village. Remember when we went on the streets in Mission to Wales, we spoke to people, they were already ready. They were ripe for the picking. It was like just going through an orchard, picking the fruit. And I just want to share with you this portable wine. It's you and I, and it's the message of Jesus. And when Jesus shared bread and wine in the new covenant, and he took that wine that was a symbol of his body in the new covenant, that wine is what's going to travel. The good news of the new covenant of Jesus is going to travel all over. We need to free it up from the vineyard. It doesn't stay local, but it travels. Many of us are grieving for the fruit that fell to the floor. The people who left us the people who didn't stay. And sometimes there is a pruning that is of God. And there's a time to mourn, and there's a time to stop mourning. There's a time to mourn and a time to dance. And in Ecclesiastes, it says there, chapter 3, verse 4, a time to weep, we've done our weeping, and a time to laugh. It's time to laugh now. A time to mourn, and we have had our losses, and a time to dance And it is time to like dance the song of the vineyard, of the wine of Jesus being spread everywhere. The time for mourning is over and let the dancing begin. So for you and I, we need fresh thinking in a new landscape. The world has changed. That is a fact. We have to change with it. We need to. I want to encourage all of us. Put our energies afresh into the new. What is our identity? What are the new tools? How can we use hybrid? Can we be agile and pivot to the new things? Are we raising teams and giving them a framework within which to work? But the old vineyard has been pruned and it's time to move on from our mourning. We can't go back because the world has changed. But here is some pastoral kindness because I am so pastoral at heart. Let's end on something that encourages. I feel like God is saying this to us in it all. When we come to share the same unchanging message of Jesus, let us find new routes for that to happen, to show his love to everyone. And in it, I want to read Hebrews 12 to us. Hebrews 12, 12. No discipline or pruning. I'm not saying COVID is like a discipline from God, but I'm saying it's like a pruning. It was a pruning, wasn't it? Of many things. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, you and I, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Lord, we ask you that you will come and heal our hearts from some of the pain of church and slogging it out in COVID. We just ask, Lord, for this group here, that you will come with your kindness and your healing, and that you will strengthen us, Lord, in the inner man, that our arms are strong and our knees are ready to run, I thank you, Lord, that you've taken us through a whole training ground. But I ask, Lord, that none of that training will be lost, but we be able to put this into practice, to move forward with your help for all that you have for us. We thank you, Lord, for this wine of the Spirit and all that you're going to do in our nation. And we pray, Lord, that it's released, that our vineyards are fruitful, that we throw out the old stones, that we build afresh. You build the vineyard, Lord, and that we will be at in the wine press that the good news is spread everywhere for your glory in Jesus name amen amen
Great. Well, we're going to go back into worship for a little bit now. And I think as we worship, I really encourage you in your hearts that if you feel while we were talking today that you know what those stones are, that you almost like lay those stones down and go, right, we're building afresh. We lay that down. Beth is going, and the band are going to lead us in worship. Yes. So let's have our hearts open to hear from God. Please stand. Let's worship together. Strong. 